welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Precision Hydration offer electrolyte drinks in different strengths to match how you sweat. Personalize your hydration strategy today at PrecisionHydration.com and get a free box or tube of pH worth up to $9.99 using the code OxygenAddict. We're also brought to you by FoodCell.co.uk. The next generation of top tube nutritional carriers for your bike, designed to allow endurance triathletes and cyclists to carry enough food and gels while allowing easy access. Check it out at foodcell.co.uk. We're also brought to you by teamoxygenatic.com triathlon coaching. Helping hundreds of age group triathletes see huge improvements in their 70.3 and Ironman performances. The time training system ensures that you get the important training done each week in a way that complements the rest of your life. All right, everyone. Welcome to the show. We've got some great stuff coming up this week, haven't we, Hells? Tell us who our interview of the week is this week, please. This week's interviewee is Anne Haug from Germany. She was third at Kona on her debut uh, last year. She's an incredible athlete, an amazing runner. She's been around the ITU circuit for years and then made the switch across to longer distance and um, has done pretty well so far, Rob. Pretty well so far. <laughs> pretty well so far. Yeah. yeah. And she's, she's really good fun. Honestly, I really enjoyed interviewing her. Good, good stuff. Giggle. Very right, funny. Well, we'll listen. We'll look forward to listening to that one later on. We've also got a couple of weeks worth of results to catch up on, and we've got some news coming up as well. So let's kick it off and jump straight into it by asking about the most important results from while I've been away. Hells, how did you get on in your Peak District Skyline Super Duper Ultra Marathon, please? Oh, yeah, we haven't chatted about that, no, have we? No, you're still alive. That's good to hear. Still alive. I didn't you know, fall down a mountainside. And the best bit was I didn't really have to do any map reading on the actual day. It was all marked. And yeah, okay, you had to be, you had to have your wits about you and make yeah. sure that you were following the little red and white flags or the, you know, red chalk or whatever on the ground. But no, minimal map reading. So it was um, Much 40... Than you thought then, was it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I really did think on the first two reccees, I thought, I'm really not going to make the cutoffs because I was so slow moving. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, it was a lot of map reading. And then the third recce, that was the one when I came home and I thought, okay, actually, I think I will be okay doing this. It's going to be a big day out and it's not going to be particularly pretty, but I think it'll be all right. Yeah. And um, so I finished in six hours and 50 minutes. Very good. How far was it? 48k. Wow, with so it's... 2,000 metres of climbing. <laughs> <laughs> big day out, then. Seven big hours in your feet. Well done. That's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So um, I I did really enjoy it. I did really enjoy it. I definitely enjoyed the distance. And I have done that distance before. I kind of forget about this. I did do an ultra in 2013. Yeah. But I just forget. So, yeah, I had sort of been there before i guess and then triathlon just i just became addicted to triathlon and i was like no no i can't enter that um no I just you also did a lot like of run. like really long runs that might not have been ultra distance but you've done loads of stuff that's been like ultra distance time on your feet ultra time kind of stuff like seven hours of running is a lot of running yeah yeah and if you can do that have... over crazy hills and off-road and stuff then you know it's definitely worth it's definitely worth a double marathon, Hells. We'll give you that. We'll give you a double marathon on the, on the road. <laughs> it's, it, it, it is weird, though, because there was, I mean, there's a lot that, right, if, if you're winning the damn thing, fine, you're flying around the whole thing. For most normal people, you're not. And and there's a lot of walking. Yeah. Because some of the paths, you just can't, you just can't run. You can't yeah. run them. There was, like, there was loads and loads of bog. Um, and then some paths were so narrow with like ferns either side and obviously being where it is, it had been super, super wet. So the bits which were boggy, I mean, there was one girl in front of me who <laughs> I was glad I was behind her. Um, she went up to her thighs in bog. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, it can be yeah. horrendous up there, can't it? It's hard to yeah. describe how like how, how wet and scary it can. I remember my mountain instructor falling in up to his armpits. Yeah, it was... <laughs> You're like, 
people could, people could just disappear up here and you would never know yeah yeah um but no it was a really good event there were interestingly rob so about 190 people in total on the start list across they have a half distance which is 14 and a half miles and then they have the full distance and they do say all over the website you know this should not be underestimated um they have a very very strict eight hour cut off and they have cut offs throughout the day as well yeah. and if you don't get to it they really will just pull you off yeah but for the half the cut off is seven hours so it's great to have a lot more flexibility with that yeah. one yeah got um it. then i think about 130 people probably started the full there were only 83 people on the finish list right okay it's so quite only a just over, yeah only just have half the field finished then yeah yeah and even in the pre-race briefing he said if you're planning on you know walking most of this or not moving particularly quickly you won't make it mm. So you, you're always feeling a bit of pressure. The clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that did definitely add to the challenge and the the doubt in your head of I don't, I really don't know if I can do this. I think I can, but I don't know. And a bit when I remember when I interviewed John Kelly, and part of the reason that he wanted to do that, his um, the Grand Round challenge was because he said I don't know if I can do it. I don't, I don't know if it is possible. Yeah. And it does keep you on your toes, doesn't it? And it keeps yeah, you yeah. interested. Yeah. So, yeah, it was um More was of that on the horizon for you? Well, I'm doing the Warrington Way, which is a 40... It probably goes past your front door. It does. It pretty much goes within 200 metres of my house. That, yeah. Well, I'm expecting an extra... It starts at like five in the morning. There's no way I'm getting up to yeah, cheer you at five in the morning. a.m. <laughs> November I'll be under the I'll be cheering you from the top window go on Helen right back to bed now <laughs> I'm expecting a special Helen aid station from Rob Wilby <laughs> you've been running about a quarter of a mile when you come back oh, really? to my house yeah it starts in Lynn Village Hall doesn't it so you, you'll have done literally about yeah, yeah. no that's good all right Some, okay yeah, so you're doing that little, and um I might come oh, down for that this... actually well you know maybe come come towards the end Maybe come for like the last couple of miles. You have to ring me and let me know you're on your way, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not waiting in Lynn Village for, w- for three hours. I want you hanging around you. from quarter past seven in the morning. Yeah. For seven or eight hours. <laughs> it's great, actually. It's a really fun day out that because most of the locals have got no idea what's going on. But the local running club put a great show on and they put balloons up all through the village centre. And then all of a sudden, some like ultra runner covered in mud staggers through the little village centre and people what's going on here yeah it's ace oh, oh good you'll enjoy that i think i'm looking forward to it i yeah. think and then rob yesterday so i'm going to italy for the iron man not to race iron man italy but i'm going out there as a race host and um i wanted to enter the 70.3 so i've got a 70.3 and an iron man oh, the same right, weekend yeah I wanted to do the 70.3 as a relay. I was like, yeah, that'd be really good. Um, all sold out. So I was like, oh, damn. Um, but then I spotted that they do have an Olympic distance race. So I've entered that. Oh, good stuff. <laughs> so my triathlon season will continue. It's it won't be over. two races. No. <laughs> so, That's the same yeah. weekend as Outlaw X, isn't it? The half yeah. Outlaw X. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll be racing so, on the same day. I've got an entry in yes. for that. Oh, great, I'll great. Racing. I'm going to be waddling around in, in triathlon kit. I don't know what racing is the word. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm going to be, I'm going to be having fun. And they've even got a night run. So I've entered that as well. 10K. Oh, I'm just brilliant. going to go all in. Yeah. Love it. So there we go. All right, let's kick on with the show, shall we? Yes. All right. Definitely. So first, we've got loads of results to cover over after a couple of weeks away. So results sponsored by Precision Hydration. If you've not been over to their website yet, go and check it out at precisionhydration.com where you can take their online sweat test. That'll give you a really good lead as to whether you're a particularly salty or heavy sweater. And if you are, you can then sort yourself out with 
customized electrolyte strength. So anything from 250 milligrams all the way up to 1500 milligrams of sodium per bottle of fluid that you take in. If you've not listened to our precision hydration sponsored um, hydration special from last week, there's loads of awesome information in there with founder Andy Blow, who probably knows more about hydration and electrolytes than pretty much anybody on the planet at the moment, I think. So go back and check that out. And yeah, go over and check them out. Remember, you can get a free box or tube of precision hydration worth nine ninety nine using the code Oxygen Addict over at their website. Right, Hells. First up, we had Norseman while we're away, and it looks we like did. first up, there's pretty awesome close racing in the men's race and a win for Lucy Gossage in the ladies' race as well. Yeah. So d- d- I, I watched a bit of the video, um, and I watched the final bit a few days after the race to yeah. see that men's finish because Hans Christian Tunzig, who got the win in uh, 9.59 and, and 40 seconds, he he's he wasn't in the lead till like really the last little bit and he could see Alan Hofter, who's won the race a number of times, just ahead of him up, up that mountain and he said, I, I thought I've just gotta go for it. I've really gotta go for it and, and dig in and he got it. And wow. so he won in the end by um a minute, so less than a minute. A minute, yeah. That's incredible over a race yeah. like that, isn't it? Imagine having to race yourself to the top of a mountain and go flat out to get there. Yeah, yeah. And then he said, he said, oh, I've dreamed since I was younger of winning this race. It's just incredible. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Immense performance. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so Lucy Gossage, after doing um, Patagon Man, entered Norseman as well and um, is absolutely loving the extreme triathlons. And yeah, she said, if you definitely, definitely put one on your list. Uh, so she got the win in 11.27 ahead of Flora College of Great Britain as well. Um, and then Kelly Stokes, who listens to the show, she finished in ninth as well. Yeah, I saw that. Good effort, hey? Yeah. And Emma well White done, of Great Britain was fourth as well. Loads of GB people. Uh, and in third place, I should mention as well, was Lena Murray Langsgith of Norway. Now then, over to Ironman Tallinn, where there was, uh, there was a fair bit of drama leading up to this. And... I was, I've got to admit, I was very ignorant of this, but apparently the sea around Tallinn is incredibly affected Baltic. by, yeah, well, it's affected by the local weather massively, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. And yep, yep. a couple of days before the race, it was completely fine. And then the wind switched to the north and the temperature dropped to 11 degrees, I think, the day before That's race right, day. Yep. So we had a couple of a couple of days, I think it was. I think yeah. they had... Yeah, we had a couple of athletes from Team Oxygen Addict Racing, and they were really like worried about. It. And I was going, "It'll be fine. Don't worry. You won't need like gloves and hats and stuff." And then they showed me the, the official documentation. I was like, "Oh, okay. Didn't know that." So they switched the race to a local lake, didn't they? The day before, moved it twenty kilometers mm. away, and had to change the whole course. So, fair play to the organisers for having a serious Plan B in operation, because you've got to imagine that's no small feat, is it? Moving it. 24 36 hours before the race to get all the transitions and stuff moved and yeah yeah so hardcore but very very fast course it looked like the conditions were well they were good for fast racing but it was pretty chilly out there for the athletes i think it was like 10 11 12 degrees out there for the run so perfect for running fast but not ideal if you were one of the slower age groupers um Mm. but yeah it looks like we had great results for great britain we had first place for queen abraham who took a pretty convincing win. And then Kimberly Morrison, who was leading for a long time, ended up in third, didn't she? Because Christian Leopold put a storming marathon together and caught her with less than a kilometre to go on the run. She put a 2.53 marathon together. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, I, I, I saw that. But she had already qualified for Kona and there were two slots on offer. It was a women-only pro race. Yeah. So Corinne Abraham got the first slot and then it did roll down to Kimberly Morrison and she will be going to Kona so she took that slot so she will be in Hawaii which is amazing she missed out in Texas by less than 30 seconds um so she's going Corin Abraham Lucy Charles Barkley Susie Cheatham Nikki Bartlett and Laura Siddle are going to be there for Great Britain. It's going to be interesting to see how having her there, sort of an, another Uber bike, is going to 
either shake change or shake up the front of the women's race because if she can if she can ride through and team up with Lucy at the front, that mm. could be very interesting, couldn't it, for Daniela Reef? Yeah. 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 Because she's a much better swimmer than Daniela Reef, isn't she? So she's going to be out the water beforehand. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. Good stuff. Exciting. Yeah. Great times for British, especially female British iron distance racing. That's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. I, th- I think I think on the female side, it's been it's been really strong for for ages. Yeah. It has. It's been. Yeah. Even yeah, more so really with strong. all those guys, all those girls racing, women racing, I should say, not girls. Yeah. Trying to be more. What's the word? I was reading an article the other day in The Guardian about how it's wrong to call women girls. And I thought, okay, yeah. I should probably not do that on the podcast anymore. No, no. <laughs> go with them. Um, go with women. Go with women. Yeah, yeah go there with we them. go. Yeah. Trying to get a little bit a little bit better all the time, Hells. Good. We can all improve in our own, own little ways. All right, then. Then we also had 70.3. How do you pronounce that in Poland? Is it Dinia? I, I don't know. Go I must admit, that, I don't know. Jan Fredino just dominated it, didn't he, on the men's side. He yes. put together a 2250 swim, 202 on the bike, and then closed it with a 111 run for 339 overall. Just, yeah. it's it, if he stays in shape and stays fit, it's hard to see past him for the win at Kona again. Yeah, yeah, oh, oh. yeah. If, 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 he's, if he's in shape. But it's going to be great this year. Ali Brownlee's going to be there as well. If he can stay healthy and in shape, yeah, totally. Yes, obviously it's going to be, you know, keenly. Sanders is still trying to qualify, isn't he, at Mont Tremblant? Yeah. So. I don't think yeah. he's going to be a factor this year, though. Next few weeks is going to be uh, interesting. Be interesting, but I just, with Fredino in shape, with Ali Brownlee healthy, mm-hmm. with uh, um, Sebi healthy and in shape, yep. Yeah. I just don't see him being a factor at all. I could be proved wrong, but we shall yeah. see. We shall see. We shall see. We shall uh, see. Maurice Clavel was second. And then in the women's race, it was won by Amelia Rose Watkinson. So Amelia Watkinson, who had a really comfortable win in 4.06. Um, she ran a 119 fastest run Toasty. of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And Susie Cheatham back on the podium. So she was third after Ironman Hamburg just a couple of weeks ago. And Claire Han in fourth as well. And then also racing in Ironman Cebu in the Philippines, uh, Caroline Stefan. I was interested to see her take a win out there. Another win. <laughs> she goes so well in the heat. And I think she could be a real dark horse for Kona, you know. I think she's under the radar a little bit, but it's well worth remembering, like, whenever it's super hot, she runs so well. Mm. Keep an eye out, Hells, in, under the radar in, um, after childbirth, but I think it could cause it some was, surprises. Um, do you know how hot it, like, just to sort of put into context how hot it would have been, like, her run was a 134. Yeah. But, um, I, I don't know, the other the other women ran sort of 136, 139, 137, and even the men, I think the... Mike Phillips was 121. Um, Tim Reed, who won did a 126, Terenzo did a 125. So yeah. it just must have been stiflingly hot. Yeah, very, very similar to Kona conditions, I think, even even more so, it's arguable. So, yeah, one to watch. Mark it down, I'm calling it now. One to watch for Kona, even though she's a little bit under the radar still. We shall see, hey? Mm. Good, good. Yeah, I like it. Okay, Hells. We've got a coach's couch this week brought to you by our sponsors, teamoxygenatic.com. We've got a question from Chris Fallon. I think other people will be able to relate to this one a lot. He says, I'm on holiday for 10 days without a bike. How should I adjust my training? <laughs> yeah, cracking, cracking one for this time of year. And I thought it'd be worth mentioning this. Chris is one of our team OA athletes. And so the first thing I sort of said to him was like, look, go away and, and actually have a holiday. Go and treat your holiday as a holiday and don't worry about training because often, and I don't really know the scientific reason for this, but often going away for a week or 10 days and not being on a bike at all seems to really freshen people up. Even if they're still doing some running and swimming while they're away, they come back and often they're in 
astonished by how strong and how fit they feel on the bike. And maybe it's just a freshness thing. So firstly, don't worry about going away and having a holiday. It won't be the end of the world. It'll be really, really good for you. Um, if you can run every other day for 30 minutes while you're away, again, you can fit that in around the idea of having a holiday without it sort of annoying your significant others. And if you get the chance, have a swim in the sea or even the pool every day, even if it's just for a few minutes. Even if you just jump in and you do a couple of reps of 100 meters while other people are reading the book, even if you don't consider it training, that frequent swimming can be really, really good for you. And one of my favorite other things to do is even even if you're away and you're not doing any training, if you can hire like a lot of local shops while you're away, have got mountain bikes for hire for like, you know, 10 euros for the day. I used yeah. to occasionally hire one and just go out for an hour, ride hill repeats on a local hill. And I had to do it in the evening just before dinner or do it first thing in the morning. And often it's a no drama way to squeeze a little bit of hard work into your holiday. And no one really notices that you're gone. You get back and everything's groovy. So if you get a chance, maybe give that a go. But if not, don't worry, go away and, and have yourself a holiday. Um, so the thing to mention is we've got a free download for the listeners. It's the Analyzing Your Race Performance document. There's a link in the show notes. And basically, it's our document that we use with our athletes for after you've had a race to go through everything that's happened in your race and to see sort of once the dust has settled to see how your race has actually been. Once you've been through that, if you feel you've not had the race you deserve or expected and you're interested in finding out how training with Team OA methodology and the time training system can help you unlock your performance, I'm offering a couple of free training consultations each week over the summer where you can talk through your training and your results with me over Skype. There's a link in the show notes and if you pop your email address in there, I'll email you to work out a time that works for us both and we can have a chat and see if we can work out what's working for you, what's not, and if we can help you out with your training. And as a little testimonial here, we've got a testimonial from Team Oxygen Addict member Fik Deck, who's recently just completed Ironman Talon. Hi there, my name is Fagin. And a year and a half ago, I got it into my head to, um, to start with triathlons. I did um, two sprint triathlons and an Olympic. But I also realized that for me, I would love to find a challenge in doing the longer distances to go, to go for the real thing. But I ran into the, the real big problem that everybody tells you, well, if you ever want to do an Ironman, you need to, run, you need to train 20, 25 hours a week, which I wouldn't have. And I wouldn't want to dedicate to it, to be honest, to, uh, as well. Um, I did my homework and I came across uh, Team Oxygen Addict the time system very tempting and um, I decided to try it so I joined just before Christmas last year and absolutely completely enjoy it for the main reason that I now understand what I'm doing it is indeed uh, an extremely effective way of training and even though in the beginning you really wonder if if it's this easy why doesn't it why doesn't everybody do it why doesn't it work so well with everybody, why are the people spending half their lifetime preparing for this? So, some doubt keeps nagging you physically. It's very often, it's also relatively relatively light. There's a lot of so let's say, let's say slow running to in the end make you go longer and faster. It's a it's a very surprising um, switch to me. Um, there's good technical uh, directions for swimming drills trainings. So. Putting that all together, I, I just decided to try it and I'm loving it. My family is loving it because in effect, I'm spending more efficient and less uh, actual time on training than when I was fidgeting on my own last year. And two weeks ago, I completed my first Ironman 70.3. Um, that was a, a great achievement. That was exactly one year after my first ever try on a sprint. Um, it didn't completely work out, but that was somebody else's fault. Um, I got up back on my bike after being hit. I finished the race and afterwards, and that was sort of the big, big moment for me for this training system. My wife said, can you imagine how your time would have been if you wouldn't have been driven into, if you wouldn't have crashed? And that, all that with the training you're putting in, it's fantastic. You have to continue. You have to come back here next year and smash the time even more. So I think that's where I'm heading. 
super proud of him for completing. He did about 12 and a half hours at Talon Hells. And that was after, and his, he mentions it there in his warm up 70.3 race, someone cut across him and he came down and really badly bashed himself up. I Ouch. think he broke either broke his elbow or his arm or his shoulder or he was just completely messed up really messed his shoulder up and his training and the run-up to it was it was really one of those like day by day what what can I do to just like get myself moving and thought Mm. for weeks he wasn't gonna have a chance of racing but he went out there and had a had a really good performance so well done Fika super proud of you for getting through that and Rob one thing you know Chris's question about going on holiday for 10 days without a bike yeah I think, think, go listen back to the Ironman UK interview and both interviews actually are relevant in a way. Brian Fogarty, who would cut back his training hugely after the birth of um, his little girl, one thing. But then Emma Hatzis as well, perhaps more sort of relevant to the question, had said, you know, when was that? May, wasn't it? That she went on honeymoon in May. She wouldn't have taken a bike. And she would have just enjoyed that honeymoon. And she said the, that rest did her absolute world, you know, yeah. world of good. And it didn't didn't really impact then on the final bit of her building block for Ironman UK. And it is all about that, the, the balance as well. And, you know, if you can go on holiday and, you know, don't worry about not having your bike with you and enjoy that family time then that's gonna keep everyone everyone happy isn't it yeah definitely it's all about balance isn't it at the end of the day yeah yeah and our bodies who knew our bodies respond well to a bit of balance every now and again it's magic <laughs> honestly i mean god i'm really good at giving other people advice and not always so good taking it my uh listening to my own advice we are, I think, shall same I say. Like that. Uh, yeah. we are aren't we it's yeah, not definitely. just me yeah so yeah yeah <laughs> 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 Oh, good. Right. So interview of the week this week, Hells, is your interview with Anne Haug. Let's pop it on now. Anna Haug, hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon podcast. How are you? Fine. Thank you very much for having me on the show. It's good to get you on. How are you doing? Because I know that this season so far, um, the last few months, has been a bit rubbish with injury. Yeah, it hasn't really gone like according to plan. So I did do the um, Dubai race and after that I was injured. So I tried to be ready for uh, Samarine and then I thought maybe I'm ready for Frankfurt, but I had to cancel all these races. And now I hope that I will be ready for Copenhagen to get my um, spot for Hawaii. Yeah. Is that going to be the last chance for you? Yeah. I had a cutoff date at the 19th of August, so until then I have to do my validation. I just have to validate my spot because I, I did podium last year. So, but it's yeah, it's kind of a challenge for me at the moment because I'm not able to run. So, um, yeah, five weeks to go until marathon. We will see. <laughs> oh, so what what have you done injury wise? Yeah, it's a bit complicated because I. Over the winter time, I had a bit troubles because it was actually after Hawaii when I start training again after my season break. I had always a bit like niggles in my plantar fascia, but it was not super bad that it told me back from running. And so I always ran over it through the pain. And after Dubai, I really had to go and see the doctor because it was quite painful. And there was a bit of a damage in my plantar fascia, so I had to stop running. And but it was just for two weeks, and I was really yeah, it was recovering really quickly, so um, I was quite happy. But after a week, I started getting problems with my shin, and yeah, since then I I'm not able to run again. Damn, damn it! So you missed Samarin, and then Frankfurt as well, where you had done so well last year. Was that yeah. horrible having to sit that one out? Yeah, for sure, because it was one of my season highlights and Frankfurt, I mean, it's close to Saarbrücken, it's kind of my home race as well. So always racing in Germany is something special if you run on home soil, you know, and it was quite hard to see. But on the other side, maybe it was good fortune for Hawaii because it was a damn tough race. So yes. maybe so maybe there could be an advantage not having raced that. So you never know. I mean, I try not to uh, yeah, think too much about what, 
yeah, what happens if. So it's like it is, and I have to deal with that. I can't change it, and I have to do the best out of it. And maybe it was a good thing as well. So you never know what's good for. You and Sarah True um, have shared the same coach a number of times, and do you still share the same coach now? Yeah, we do. We yeah, so, so you yeah. must have been in touch with her. Is she like, have you been in touch with her since Frankfurt? Yeah, I mean, I sent her a message, obviously, but she got a lot of messages, I assume, but I was really suffering with her because, I mean, it was so dramatic because she looked like the winner and I actually didn't see the finish line because I just checked the um, the, the ticker and I saw 41 point something K. She is in the lead with seven minutes. So I went to... Uh, to do my bike ride obviously and said, uh, texted dad oh congratulations two wins and they said oh no it was really dramatic sarah ended up in hospital so it was like oh, oh. shit oh, it was no. really... and i'm so sorry for her because she really really deserved that but iron man is a beast you know it's finished after the marathon it is, it is a beast and have you how have you found the beast compared to itu yeah, I mean, it's a, it's like a completely different kind of sports, to be honest, because, I mean, in short course, it's just about speed, you know? It's limited by a lactate tolerance, and energy is not a problem. I mean, it's just a problem how fast can you really go. And in Ironman, it's completely different. I mean, they, you just have a certain amount of energy, and you have to be really, really efficient with that. And that's something I have to learn and like switch my body completely because he's not used to uh, like going very economic because it wasn't any use for that. It was just going really fast and no matter how much energy you waste with that. And now it's like completely different and it's something you have to really train for and you can't switch it in one year. Have you enjoyed the new challenges? Because had you got to the point with the WTS circuit of falling out of love with it? I'm not really falling out of love with it. My heart is still with ITU because I love racing against the other athletes and I love high speed. But ITU changed really much. And I mean, I have this weakness in my swim and I, I felt that I, I don't make it anymore. You know, you have to be in the first pack and the bike causes changed quite a lot. I mean, I wasn't a good swimmer in the past as well, but I was able to ride myself in the first pack because like the bike courses were quite hilly and yeah I was able to ride myself in the first pack but now it's not uh, not possible anymore you have to be super super strong in the swim otherwise your race is gone so I didn't see any hope to be as, as successful as I was and yeah you know you always have the burden of winning two championship medals and you don't uh, don't want to do it less than that yeah every race you expect to be podium and I didn't believe that anymore that I could do that so I desperately yeah wanted a new challenge I wanted to have a fresh start where no one expected anything from me where I don't have burdens of one medals you know so I wanted a fresh start and Ironman seems to be the perfect like yeah challenge for me what's that pressure do you feel that pressure from yourself or did you feel it from the sort of German public as well because triathlon's so big in Germany? Yeah, I mean, it shouldn't be an excuse, but I mean, the pressure you feel is always the pressure you make with yourself. But I really felt it after I went, uh, won first the silver medal and everyone expected me the year after to win gold. And when I won just bronze, uh, I felt like the loser of the nation, you know, because everyone was expecting gold. And if you just get third no one cares anymore you know and it was kind of disappointing and I had to learn a lot about media and uh, that's yeah you can't change it I mean if you win everyone loves you and you don't <laughs> win no one loves you and that's, a, <laughs> that's the lesson you learned quite quickly so the Rio Olympics you've described as like a completely traumatic experience is that because of all that pressure or the realization of I'm not where I was anymore? Um, there were two factors, to be honest, because, I mean, I had this pressure because the Federation definitely wanted to a medal. And we had a plan that I will get a domestic, the, the best one 
of Germany who qualified get some domestiques to make the medal come true, uh, come real. So we had this plan with the domestiques and six weeks before the race in Rio. Um, some athletes went to court and yeah, I don't have any domestiques anymore. So I felt completely not unprepared, but my plan was gone four weeks in front of the race and I didn't really feel confident anymore and the pressure was really high because there was still the pressure of getting a medal and I was on my own and I, I was really really fit in running but I was like prepared to have someone helping me on the bike and yeah so my plan went down and my confidence wasn't great at all so yeah it shouldn't be an excuse because I mean it's still an individual sport but we prepared for something different and four weeks out of the games it changed completely it was like a shock for me <laughs> and was there a similar plan at London 2012 or for, for no. Germany no, that's the reason why we definitely wanted to change it, not make the same mistake again. So that was the original plan, but then it didn't really went like plan. <laughs> what do you miss then most about the WTS and the ITU circuit? Yeah, I miss the high speed, to be honest. I, I miss the the fight against the other athletes, the maximum speed, the... Yeah, the athletic. I don't know if you describe it right, but I mean, the 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 depth of the the depth of the quality of the athletes is so high. I mean, if you have one single like point of weakness in a race, you will end up last or whatever because it's so tight. And I really miss that. Do you miss the people as well? Yeah, of course. I mean, he, he developed friendships over the years and I'm still in contact with a few athletes, obviously. And But to be honest, if they're getting older, they come back to Ironman, <laughs> so we will meet them again. So in Hawaii, it was, half of the field was actually former ITU athletes, so it was quite nice. I was going to say, of the current crop of ITU who haven't yet made the switch because they're focusing on Tokyo... Who would you like to be racing at Kona in 2021? I think a very, very good um, Ironman athlete would be Flora Duffy. Obviously, she's very strong. And Katie Safira, she's really strong. So all the really strong racers, they would be fantastic Ironman athletes as well, for sure. And what did, what did you make of your first Kona experience? I mean, it was tough. It was really, really tough. I mean, I was there in 2012. Tough, tougher than you had expected? Yeah, actually, yes. Because, I mean, I was there in 2012 because we prepared for the grand final in Auckland because it was obviously the same timeline. It was just one hour switch in one day. So, I mean, you in the uh, same time zone. So we prepared in Hawaii. And I knew it was, like, hot, hot. But, I mean... You always have in mind that you don't have to race in Hawaii, so you prepare just for, for Auckland. But when I arrived last year, I was kind of shocked, and I was so happy that my coach said, you have to be there at least 14 days before, otherwise you won't adapt. And it was exactly the right choice to go more than two two weeks before because it was like, yeah, you, you can't prepare for that because it's so, so humid. It's not only hot, it's so humid, and you're not used to that. It, it, it's not it's not Germany, is it? <laughs> it definitely not Germany, no. And did you, like, how did the finish line shoot compare in Kona to some of the ITU races that you've done, maybe Hamburg or any of the, you know, the Olympics? Uh, I mean... Hamburg is so present in my mind that would be always my absolute highlight. And to be honest, in short, because it was a sprint race, you're, you, you're mentally fresh enough to soak everything up. And in Hawaii, to be honest, it was a really, really struggle because I felt quite well until K41. And the last K, I was like, I remember Sarah, so I can't feel with her because the last K was so horrible. And I thought, oh, God, I, I won't make the finish line. And to be honest, I, I don't really have any, like, I don't really know what the finish shoot was about because I was so struggling with making it to the finish line that I don't have really memories in that, to be honest. Did you 
Did you think you could get on the podium? It was my hope, obviously. I mean, you always dream of it, and that's a motivation for your everyday training. So, and deep inside me, I thought there's a possibility. I just didn't know if I can make it in my first year because there's just so much to learn, and it's not like predictable because. You never know what happened. I mean, I met the experience in, in Frankfurt before that after 10K of the run, the energy was over. I mean, it was so struggling and my run never, like, I I always had a good run. No matter how, in ITU, how, no matter how hard I, I was going on the bike, I always had a strong run. And to see that my, that I'm really struggling with my run was kind of like something what like makes me a little bit unsure if I can run a marathon so I went really really conservative because my just my goal was it to run through the marathon with no stopping no pretzel eating in between <laughs> so that was my so I mean I always knew that I'm a good runner but I just don't know if I can make it on the Ironman marathon so and so Different. after after the 10k at Frankfurt and at kilometer 41 in Hawaii when you're thinking I don't know, you know, all these doubts are in your head. What do you think about? I try to focus on, I mean, I try to break the marathon down in really little sections. So if I'm feeling I'm struggling, I make the section even even smaller. So I just think from nutrition point to nutrition point and th maybe that's two kilometers and I just think okay now focus on your technique. The next time you like singing a, your most favorite song or you, you just have to distract your, your thoughts a bit because the brain, if, you, if it's getting really tough, your brain always has you pain, 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 stop, stop, sleep. And you just have to like get your head um, distracted with something else. You just have to like focus on other things. And yeah, the harder the race, the more difficult it is. But I mean... You have to have a big tool of like songs or. Um... I was going to say, so what? What is on your playlist? What's on your playlist? I mean, to be honest, I really love the song from Eminem and Rihanna. I like the way it hurts because I think, okay, I just feel better if I hear that because it's like, yeah, it hurts. But I mean, you have to get through it. It's just pain. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. So, and at one very interesting thing about you is that you didn't learn to swim until you were 20. Yes. So yeah, that's well. <laughs> how, how did you then, how did you teach yourself to swim? I mean, I watched other people underwater. I had YouTube and yeah, I studied sports. Then I met my, my swim coach that I'm working at the moment as well. So yeah, I learned it from, yeah. From the scratch. <laughs> uh, any tips? You learned it. That's the problem. <laughs> because otherwise, I would say it to you if I would learn it. <laughs> so, what tips would you give to people who are thinking, "I'm going to teach myself to swim"? I wouldn't recommend that. To be honest, I wouldn't take a coach because it goes much faster. And once you have a bad technique, it's so hard to get rid of that. So. If you are a completely beginner, take a good coach and listen to him because swimming is all about technique. And if you have a, a wrong technique, it will like you can't be as fit as you want. You won't make it in the swim because you're just slow. <laughs> and do you still find the swim now really hard? And to be honest, um, I was always struggling in ITU because I was just like so afraid of this like bunching up in the water and I was really in panic and since I switched to Ironman I'm much more relaxed and I I must say I kind of enjoy swimming now because I mean it's it's all about swimming now because there's not so much fighting and it's just about swimming because no one bunches you up on a 3.8k <laughs> swim and to be honest the first buoy isn't uh, about 200 meters so you have a long line to swim and then it spreads out and yeah the the fields are not that dense like in ITU so it's much more enjoyable and yeah I make peace with that <laughs> the words coming out of your mouth enjoyable and swim <laughs> yeah 
I think that's a success. I think that's amazing. So your coach, Dan, Dan Lorang, um, you and he met years ago, didn't you? When you were, you were both students. Yeah, yeah. We started together. We met actually in the triathlon course at university. And yes, he was a fellow student of mine and um, he had a, a cycling background. He was a professional cyclist before and um, he was on the switch to getting a couch and he saw me and said, oh my God, what are you doing? I mean, I think I wrote you some trainings plan and see how far we can get with that. And yeah, since he started coaching me, I was like improving every year, every year. And in between four years, I found myself in the World Cup. So it was amazing. And so did he specifically coach you on the bike or did he coach you across? Yeah, yeah he coached me um, in a triathlon. I mean, I always had a swim coach for the detailed plans, but um, he he was coaching me as a triathlon coach, yeah. Wow. And so you've been together now, apart from when you went and joined um, Darren's squad, you've worked yeah. with Dan for like years. Yeah, since I was, I think... I started when I was 23 and it's 13 years now, yeah. <laughs> and what have you learned the most from him? Uh, I mean, that consistency is the key. I mean, just you have one session which is really good doesn't make your season. I mean, you have to put continuously good work in it. Don't overdo it. Don't make fancy stuff. It's all about consistency and be, yeah, be nice to your body you just have the you just have one so be conscious of them and um yeah don't overdo it Consist consistency that's the key i i i don't i've never heard many people say be nice to your body i think that's amazing <laughs> it's so true and dan like you don't he's not near you is he for coaching it's sort of remote yeah I mean, we do online coaching via training speaks, but he knows me so well. And he, I mean, he can look inside my body pretty good through my data. So um, we just know each other for so long and we, we are in contact uh, via um, telephone or Skype or, or WhatsApp. And I'm working here in Saarbrücken with my physio, Sabrina Hoppe. And she's in, in regular contact with him. So she, she is coaching me on a daily base. She, she is around me with every heart session and she um, takes all the daily decisions. And so it's like she is her eye. So, um, yeah. And do you so do you train a lot on your own? Yeah. I mean, when I was, I, I think it's important to have a really good squad if you're racing ITU because you just, you need the speed and you need, uh, yeah, to cringe really deep and like, you know, um, it's all about speed. And I, I still have that speed in me. So I, I need this endurance work. And I mean, it's part of the game to be really long time alone and alone with your thoughts and yeah it's good to train it on a daily base so i'm not alone i'm i'm on the in the olympic training center so i have people around me but my training session i do on my own and do you i know dan is also the coach to jan fredino did like when did that come about was that a few years ago as well was that via you or how, how did any of that come about Dan, Dan was actually the national coach here in Saarbrücken and he met Dan obviously as his function as, as um, yeah, national coach and after the London games um, Dan wanted to make the switch, uh, Jan wanted to make the switch to long course and he was getting in touch with, with Dan Laurel and yeah since then they are amazing team and they fit perfectly together. <laughs> What's it like having in long course having the likes of Keenler, Lang, and Fredino? These incre and and there are more. There are many more German men as well, just absolutely dominating the Ironman. Yeah, that's really amazing because it it pushes the sports a lot. So Ironman is compared to ITU. I mean, ITU is always, if you're really successful, then the media like, um, yeah, show it in TV, but you have to be podium. Otherwise, the medias are not really interested. And in, in Iron Man, it's different because the man obviously always podium. So Iron Man is really, really big in Germany. 
And yeah, especially there are so many age groupers who obviously do Ironman because they think, oh, that's a real triathlon. So um, yeah, the Ironman community is just big and you're quite popular if you're an Ironman athlete compared to ITU. What do you do to relax? I like like knitting and crochet and all this or doing Sudoku, really, really boring things, but I kind of like it. You you like so what do you knit? Uh hats. Normally hats. I like <laughs> or socks or yeah, whatever. <laughs> and when when did you learn to knit? Actually when I was really young, I mean I remember that I was three or four years old that I went to my mom and said, Oh mom, I definitely want to knit. Show me that and yeah, I started knitting a scarf for my granddad and for my grandfather when I was, I think I was four, and he didn't really like it, but he didn't say me. <laughs> so now, do you make lots of hats for your friends? Yeah, actually, I do a lot of hats, but I never really use it because I have so many of them, so I, I donate it or, or give it to friends, yes. <laughs> this is very cool. I have a friend who, uh, it's a guy, and... He learnt to knit when his, I think his dad died, and he learnt to knit so then he could keep his mum company. Oh, okay. And now he makes hats. And you do something and you immediately see what you have done. So it's it's perfect because in training, you train and train and you don't really see the result. But in knitting, you do something and then you have a result. And that's so amazing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and I've, I've seen that you've done a few um, photo shoots recently. Um, one of them was in a craft, like with craft beers. Is that to do with a sponsor or do you like craft yeah. beer? And I'm not a beer drinker normally now. I got, uh, I'm got i sponsored by uh, Meisel Zweiser. That's a local brewery here. And that's my very first sponsor. And I have a really personal relationship with that. And yeah, we, we found the time to do a really big uh, photo shoot. And it was kind of really fun doing that. And the other one which I saw, which looked amazing, was in the opera house. Yeah, we did we did a cover shooting for the Try Time. That's the big German triathlon magazine, and they wanted me to have on the cover. So um, yeah, they thought because um, Bayreuth, the my hometown, is very popular with the Opera House, and yeah, it was quite hard to get a a, a photo shoot inside there because it's like um, I don't know how you call it, but not everyone is allowed to go inside and take some pictures yep. so we need an allowance for that and yeah the pictures were amazing because of the location <laughs> do with the people like the people who own it when you know when they said so we want to bring a bike in here a bicycle were they like oh yeah they were not really happy about that <laughs> and we just had the allowance to be just one meter behind the stage and not touching everything so every time she was because we always had one um, keeping her busy and then we put the bike a little bit further and make the pictures and then we put it back again so it was it was interesting um if you're listening to this and you're not sure what we're talking about go and check out uh, annie's instagram sort of page because they're all on there and it looks really really cool so when you were younger you did loads and loads and loads of different sports didn't you what was your favorite sport when you were younger I love to play tennis I mean I got in touch with tennis when I was five years old and I really really loved it and I was quite good in that but I started with my sister and she wasn't really fancy about that and when she was I think 10 and I'm nine she decided no she wanted to do something else and I don't know why but I decided oh why not doing something else so my father was a anyway was a sports teacher and he wanted me to do every kind of sport and not getting too specific when you are young just to get a big range of, of movement patterns or whatever you call it and so yeah I played football and soccer and volleyball and I did a lot of winter sports and literally did everything <laughs> so yeah I didn't swim that was my problem <laughs> maybe I should have been sticking with swimming but, you know. when you were younger which sport were you most successful at tennis yeah oh really oh, oh, yeah. I mean yeah I was a world champion in Indiaka so maybe that's the uh, yeah world champion in Indiaka what, what what's Indiaka 
Jacke is like it's it, we play it like volleyball and it's a it's kind of a yellow ball with red feathers on it and you play it with your hand like volleyball but just five against five over a net and it's like an indoor sport like yeah it's exactly like volleyball is not it... as popular as volleyball but... <laughs> so I must admit <laughs> I hadn't heard of it until I read about this amazing feat of yours. Yeah, it's um, very, very popular. <laughs> but was it, I don't know, was it played at your school or was it played in your region? No, no, I played it with my youth group. So it's more like a YMCA sports, you know, with a Christian background. And yeah, but the World Championship obviously is more popular. So um, yeah, you, I started in the youth group and... Just did it on the weekends, and then we get more successful and successful, and then we ended up at the World Championships, and we won it, and it was amazing. <laughs> and where, where were where were the World Championships? In Estonia, in Tartu. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. And were there people from, I mean, South America and Australasia, or was it quite a lot of European countries? No, it was one of Brazil, obviously, and um, I can't really remember. Estonia, obviously, then um, Switzerland, Austria. Yeah, it was everywhere. Love it. I love it. Um, so how fast do you think that you can run when when you're 100% fit? And which distance? <laughs> well, let's go 70.3 first. I mean, my 114 in, in um, Dubai was quite quick, so I didn't expect that. So I try not to put any limits anymore because, I mean, you surprise yourself every time. So I, I just go as hard as I can and see how fast I can go. So I was quite surprised with my 114. I thought maybe that's the limit, but you never know. <laughs> and then over the Ironman distance? Uh, that's a bit of a beast, you know, because it's not about speed anymore. That's my problem because I, I, I ran one marathon after the Olympics relatively unprepared and I did a 2.35. So um, I know I can run fast, but that's not the same like doing a marathon in an Ironman because it's not about speed. It's about efficiency. And that's the thing I always struggling because when I started Ironman I thought oh yeah I can run it must be possible to run it in at least 245 but that's a problem you don't have the energy anymore to do that and in my head I always think it must be possible and I still believe it and that's my big motivation because I mean I haven't proved it yet but as long as I believe it it's a good motivation for training I'm not sure if it's possible ever but I believe that it's possible to run faster but we will see maybe it's yeah over the years you get more efficient but I mean in my head it's the existence that I can run much much faster but you have to prove it obviously <laughs> do you have to change your bike tactics because you know that you know your run is so strong uh for the ironman mm. i mean i because i mean i just did two ironmans i didn't really had a tactic at all so uh, my plan for hawaii was really to to be in the group and do nothing because our focus wa was to run the marathon without stopping so um i didn't really have the yeah, the the abilities to be tactical on the bike yet. So, um, I mean, for this year, I hope my bike is much stronger and I'm more able to have a bit more tools on board on the bike. So, um, yeah, but for my first time in, in Hawaii, the, I didn't have the abilities to be, like, going hard on the bike because, I mean... It was just my second Ironman, and uh, the trauma trauma of, of Frankfurt was still in my mind with the marathon. So I was really, really conservative, and yeah, I hope I can change my tactics for next year. It's exciting. And when when you look at obviously Daniela and Lucy, what do you think everyone has to do to catch up with Daniela and Lucy? 
Obviously, you have to swim really, really quick. You have to be really, really strong on the on the bike, and then you have to run an amazing marathon. So yeah, it's really hard to beat them, to be honest. But I mean, it's it's good to see what's possible because if you don't have people like Daniela and Lucy, you wouldn't change your or you wouldn't ch- uh, challenge your body enough. You know, if you see okay, that's a benchmark. Everyone is like going close to them and if you don't have them there wouldn't be need to go better or train harder or yeah so that's the inspiration for every one of us and it makes us realize what's possible and maybe believe one day it's possible for you as well so um it's it's great to have them in the sport they they are amazing you were able to see lucy sort of crush it at Rot the other day because sadly you were injured um so you went and you were part of the commentary team what was it like being part of the commentary team rather than actually racing yeah I mean it was kind of hard you know but on the other side it was nice to really watch them racing because in a race you never have the chance to watch someone because you're either behind or in the back so it was really nice to see how she's like squeezing it out and how she's doing on the swim on the bike and in the run and I must really say she improved a lot on the run as well so it looks fantastic her run and yeah it's I mean she is the one to beat I mean it would be it would be interesting to see how she can go against Daniela this year in Hawaii but I mean she really really improved and the, she always has the swim so She's always in the lead and has this tactical advantage. So, um, yeah, we will see. Did it make you want to do um, Rot? Definitely, yeah, because, I mean, it's it's home soil, you know. All the, I saw Andy Dreitz winning it and everyone was just going crazy because he's from Franconia as well. And it was so nice to... to it was the first time ever I think that a Franconian uh, local guy won and it was just amazing and it wanted me to start there once so maybe so, yeah. maybe next year maybe you never know I mean know. <laughs> I think in, in sports you can't do any plans because there's just things happening you can't is which are not in your hands so I definitely want to do that if it's next year or the year after you never know I want to ask one final thing. Uh, your dad, so he was a PE teacher. Does he do um, carpentry, like sculptures as well? Yeah, he does. It's just, After he retired, he found this new love for that. And our whole basement is full of his sculptures. And yeah, he's really into it and he loves it. And he improves a lot, to be honest. So the first year it was kind of, yeah really rough and raw wood but now it's really great sculpture so every time I back home I'm not very often at home but I can't really see the improvements every time I'm back home has, has he made a wooden swim bike run thing yet not wooden but after the Olympics um, he um, put it in a stone so when I come home after the Olympics I had the sculpture with the swimmer the biker and the runner out of stone in front of the home door and I was like oh very nice <laughs> that's amazing uh, well I, I'm going to let you go um, thank you so much for your time this morning I'm no keeping worries. my fingers crossed that you will be back running very very soon um, it's been brilliant having you on and um, yeah good luck for the rest of the season Thank you very much. Rob, don't you love that she taught herself to swim by watching YouTube love videos? It. I love it. <laughs> it's like the dream, isn't it, of every every age grouper? I can I can teach myself by watching YouTube videos. That's brilliant. <laughs> I think yeah. I mean, yeah. There was a there's a, a lot of work, and obviously, it's still she finds the still swim it's still difficult. But even just things like you know, how do you switch off? Oh, I like to knit. I mean, who knew? <laughs> Who knew? But yeah, it, it, it's cool that she's still, well, I hope. So as this goes out, she's obviously going to be racing Copenhagen. She needs to just finish to qualify for Kona. Yeah. But when I did the interview a few weeks ago, she was still rehabbing from an injury. And I think she was on the, um, the old G thing, treadmill. Oh, yeah. 
she was on that when we were still speaking. So I really hope that over the past couple of weeks since then, she's rehabbed enough to be able to, yeah, complete a marathon basically um, and competitively and, yeah, finish Copenhagen and then head out to Kona again because it was great having her there in the mix and everything really up there and chasing everyone down on the run. Yeah. Let's hope that she can make it, hey? I hope so. Really hope so. Good, good. All right, then. So we've got loads of bits and bobs of news that we've seen over the last couple of weeks as well. So sponsored by Food Cell. The price of a food sale has been reduced by five pounds to thirty nine ninety nine, and they're the competition on. You can you could have won yourself an entry to Outlaw X taking place on the twenty second of September at Thorsby Park in Nottinghamshire. That competition is now closed. Listen out for the winner very, very soon. So if you're looking for a solution for carrying food and gels on your top tube, on your bike, and if you're racing middle or long distance, you do need to sort yourself something out. We think food cell is the best thing out there for it. Fits neatly on a top tube using either top tube bolts or natty little Velcro ties. And you can fit either four big fat gels or two big chumps of flap jab or even your spares kit inside this thing. It's aerodynamic and it looks good on your bike as well. So we're very impressed with this product. I think it's the best thing out there for carrying stuff on your top tube. And it means you can keep your aerodynamic lines nice and sleek in your race skin suit without needing pockets full of stuff crammed in as well. So you can check that out over at foodcell.co.uk. Right, some news then, Hells. First up... Show skipper in the national was it the national 12 hour time trial yes it was yep national 12 hour championship now as we go to press as it were the results are still a little bit up in the air tell me about this hells because either way he's done a ridiculous distance hasn't he yes it, <laughs> it's unbelievable so the cycling time trials um have joe in first place which is Yep, that's that's really fine, that bit. Champion. And well they done. say he's done 309.52 miles, which on its own yeah. is just... Over 25 a... miles an hour for 12 hours. <laughs> just mental. Yeah. Mental, yes. The now, plot thickens, however. <laughs> on the Facebook feed, Joe said it was 324 miles unofficially. He said that was from his Garmin, the Wahoo ran out of battery, but he said he'll go by what he sees on the official results. However, there is quite a difference there, isn't there? Yeah. Um, between the official and between what Joe got. And there was some sort of comment that, oh, did he um, sort of miss a, a lap at the beginning or did something go wrong? And then other people were saying, no, that was part of the course. And then someone else had said, you know, 12 hour results for this event can take a while to finalize because of how the finishing circuit's managed. Um, but you never know. So the provisional CTT version is 309. Joe's is 324. 324 I believe would be a new record um and if if you know 324 is <laughs> 27 on. miles an hour for 12 <laughs> hours I knew better than that he's averaged 294 watts for 12 hours and to put that in context it's the equivalent of riding like what was the mass we did before like low 420s for an Ironman bike split mm but back to back. three of them back to back without a break. And on, and let's be honest, on UK roads, in yeah. UK conditions. Yeah. <laughs> Just. It's unbelievable. The, the, that is amazing. Yeah. yeah. And and yeah. it was because he hasn't, he's not been able to run, has he? Yeah. So, so he's been injured. So he's been doing a lot of work on the he's Clearly bike. working on his biking, isn't it? Oh, <laughs> my Lord. Yeah. <laughs> So, Joe, that is absolutely Hats phenomenal. off to you, national champion. Love it. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. All right, other news then. Ali Brownlee's down to race 70.3 Dunleary, just near Dublin, which is which is great news. It looks like he's not on the start list. Maybe you can confirm this. He's not on the start list for the Tokyo Test event or the ITU yep. Grand Final. Is he going all in for the seventy point three World Championships in Nice? So he did say that he he did say that, and and um, Mark Buckingham as well had said that that is one of the that is like the main goal seventy point three World Champs. Yeah. And I've seen an interview with him this year as well saying the same thing. Um, and then obviously he's got Kona now. The 
the selection for the Olympics, there are still other, basically it doesn't, for Ali Brownlee, it doesn't all come down to the Tokyo test event. Yeah. So that's why he can not go to the Tokyo test event. Yeah, you'd imagine that they've got a they selected to put themselves some wiggle room in there to to pick somebody like him. Um, what would you think if he if he races seventy point three worlds in Kona this year? Yeah, can you see him going back to be competitive at the Olympics next year? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I love it. Totally. You wouldn't well, bet against him, would you? If he's on the start list, healthy at Tokyo. God, you would no. not bet against him. <laughs> no. And if and you know, if, if there's still sort of wiggle room to actually yeah, to qualify, you know, then then why not have done things differently this year? Yeah. Had the opportunity to he says, go and see what Kona's all about, but this year and then be competitive sort of in the future there. Yeah. So we yeah, both know he's going there yeah. to race his socks off this year, though, don't we? We both know well, yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. And so. also Tim Dunn's racing at Dunleary as well. So that'll be an interesting head-to-head between those two. Elliot Smales is there. It's going to be yeah. a good field. Nicky Bartlett on the ladies' side as well as Laura Siddle. So, yeah, yeah some good racing. I think there's some decent names on that list, aren't there? Sure are. Uh, also... Sebi Keenley has announced that he is going full on to race at Nice at the 70.3. Exactly. So this is what it brings. Exactly. So it's all, oh, it's all really exciting. And he actually says, I don't know if I'll be able to come. Well, he says complete, but I think he means compete against the likes of Ali Brownlee and uh, Javier Gomez. But the hard bike course should definitely yeah. suit me. So he wasn't able to compete at the 70.3 World Champs in South Africa last year. He was injured, and I think that gave him a bit more oomph to to want to go there and have a chance and getting his Achilles sorted and then go back in the mix. So, yeah, yeah. that's cool. And, you know, we saw him win the championship at Samarin, didn't we? And just the... And like he was like, I just had to go for it in his post race yeah. interview. He did chasing Peter Heimek down, and yeah, that was cool. So if he's on form, that's going to be a great race. Do and then, his, Jan, sorry to on. interrupt. Did you know Jan Fredino racing at Nice as well? I haven't seen um, it confirmed whether he is or not. Don't know. Let me come back to you on that one, Rob. Because I mean, you'd like to think he would be, wouldn't you? I know he's he's kind of bigger guy, but. It'd be great. You know he's going to be competitive over that kind of course. So to have Brownlee, Gomez, Keenley, and Fredino racing each other. Uh, Love it. Not apparently not. Apparently not. Ah, got it. Uh, he wants well, it, to. It remains to go be seen, all in for Kona. Yeah. So. Hmm. Even so, it's going to be an amazing race. Not long to go now to find out. No, not long, not long. And um, I think next week we will have with India Lee, who is going to be competing out at the 70.3 World Champs as well. Good stuff. So we'll look forward to that interview with India Lee. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And last bit of news then, Hella Fredrickson has announced a retirement, hasn't she? She's just come up. Yeah, that's it on Friday. So she was due to be sort of having one last hurrah at Ironman Copenhagen uh, this weekend coming. But uh, I think she's realised that, no, I'm I'm not going to get back sort of fit. Yeah, body's had absolutely enough. So she's such an interesting person. I I think I will try to um, chase her down at some point and um, have a word with her because, yeah, she like away from sport, super, super intelligent. I mean, lots of people are super, super intelligent, but I mean, genuinely, she could have done, I think, I think she's got like, she's done loads of studies in uh, nutrition, I think to do HD, I think that was what I was trying to say. Um, but yeah, went sort of down the triathlon career as well. And um, yeah, has had a fine, I'd say fine career and achieved probably more than she ever expected to. I think at the- point people to the article on slow twitch to go and read about her because i didn't know a lot of this she she's had some unbelievable injury and health problems yeah unbelievable she, setbacks yeah she had a, a crash 
Well, she came off the bike. She had chain ring lacerations to her neck, and forehead and upper lip. She had injuries to her coccyx and severe burns dismounting on hot tarmac at a race in Spain. And then it said she, she developed an acute allergic reaction to birch pollen, which doesn't sound like much, right? But it says, while training for the 2012 Olympics, she developed tremendous amounts of mucus and her diaphragm became incredibly tight and painful during a morning swim. They thought she'd had a heart attack and it turns out that she'd suffered rib stress fractures from all of this pollen allergy. I mean, that's, that's hideous, isn't it? Gosh, that's awful, yeah. <laughs> oh, Ouch. God bless her. So, Hella Fredrickson, we wish you all the best. She's writing an autobiography, which I'm sure is going to be very, very interesting to read. I love stories about, you hear stuff like that and you go, people have overcome stuff you just had no idea that they were dealing with. You yeah. see them winning races and go, I, I tend to assume everyone's got an easier life than me, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, amazing yeah. to read, isn't it? Yeah, that's cool. That is no, it'll be it'll be a good one to read. And then uh, Rob, you know, with the weather so delightful um, over changeable, this weekend, changeable, changeable. Um, yeah, a lot of people I think um, did a turbo session this weekend. So um, I'm just going to give a shout out to a few people. So Richard Milner said he did three hours, kept sane by uh, watching videos nice. of Northman as inspiration for the half X next month. Neil Crump. Um, he sent us photos of him doing handstands. He's now, nice. you know, spending time in the uh, in the gym. Oh, that's quite impressive. Yeah. But he's up against a climbing frame, and I did say, "Can you do it without the frame yet?" And he's like, "No, it's a work in progress." But for you know, someone in their mid forties, only just starting yeah. to discover the power of handstands, I'm doing okay. Good work. Um, yep. Yeah. Then, uh, yeah, Stephen Whiston said that he had a lovely day at the Kilbury Sportive um, up in Scotland. Uh, and then who else said, yeah, Pedro Acha said that he usually works on Saturdays, but then he was onto the turbo. John Brunt, uh, he said gutted he's inside. Keith Charlton said mind numbing. Any tips for rainy day indoor sets? Specificity. <laughs> um, Emma Cowper was doing two lots, double turbo day. Paul said that he was doing a tempo run and turbo looking likely for Sunday. Um, David Irwin, he went to park run. Sandy, Sandy was on the turbo as well. So loads of you were on the turbo. And then Dave Harrison, rest day, still in bed with a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people getting it done apart from you. <laughs> Me or Dave? Dave. Yeah. I went out on my bike for an hour on Saturday. No, good for you. Yeah, I was impressed with that. Oh, they're doing it. (laughs) Love it. Yeah. (laughs) All right, then. Let's wrap this up, everybody. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, Thanks to our sponsors, precisionhydration.com, foodcell.co.uk, and teamoxygenatic.com. You've been listening to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. I'm Coach Rob Wilby. I'm Helen Murray. And yeah, thanks very much for listening. Tune in again next week when we'll have an interview with India Lee. And until then, have a great, safe training and racing week. And we'll speak to you all again soon. Cheers, everyone. See ya.